So, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, the analysis that we are interested in uh, will use a macroscopic or a black box approach uh, that ignores internal details. Uh, so, what do we mean by this? Okay. So, when we say that a certain amount of heat is uh, transferred to or from a device, uh, we do not look at the uh, exact process by which this heat is transferred. For instance, we do not worry about whether it is due to conduction heat transfer or convection heat transfer or radiation. We simply say that a certain amount of heat is transferred to or from the device. We do not worry about the details. Similarly, when we say that a certain amount of work or power is uh, supplied to a device, let us say to a compressor, uh, we do not really bother about whether the compressor is a centrifugal compressor or an axial flow compressor or even for instance a reciprocating compressor for that matter. We simply say that a certain amount of power is uh, transferred, work is transferred uh, to the device and that is uh, used for compressing a certain amount of air, either a certain uh, quantity of air or air is compressed with a certain mass flow rate. That is the only difference, uh, but we do not worry about the internal details of how the work that we are transferring to the compressor is actually realized in the form of an increased pressure. Okay. So, these details are usually uh, covered uh, when mechanical engineering students uh, later on in their higher semesters do a course on heat transfer or fluid mechanics or turbo machines. Okay. In the same manner, uh, we do not really uh, worry about how a turbine converts the enthalpy of the incoming fluid into uh, power. So, it could be an axial flow turbine, uh, it could be a radial turbine, uh, the exact details are immaterial. We treat the uh, turbine itself as a black box and say that uh, fluid enters with a certain enthalpy, leaves with a certain enthalpy and we determine the amount of uh, power that the turbine generates. So, that is, uh, that is one important thing that we understand or we should understand when we say that we follow the macroscopic approach. Okay. The second thing that is important in the context of a, a macroscopic approach is that molecular level details are also ignored. Okay. We assume the working substance to be a single entity with a unique value for the properties uh, such as pressure, density, temperature and so on. Okay. What, we, uh, what we mean by this is, uh, is this. So, let us say I have a, a vessel like this which is filled with air and um, if I measure the uh, pressure of the air at this location or at this location or at this location or any location for instance, not only pressure any property of the air, uh, they must all have the same value. So, the density measured here, uh, here, here or any other location should be, should all be the same. Temperature measured at all these locations should all be the same. Okay, so, uh, the working substance that is what we mean when we say the working substance is assumed to be a single entity. Uh, now, for this, uh, uh, for this thing to hold uh, uh, certain uh, conditions have to be met which we will discuss uh, next. And we must also uh, keep in mind that mixing and stirring processes are assumed to be macroscopic in nature. For instance, you know when uh, two gases are allowed to mix and we want to do a thermodynamic analysis, we do not use concepts like uh, Graham's law of diffusion and so on. We assume that you know they are mixed well and it is a homogeneous mixture. So, we can go ahead with the analysis. We do not look at molecular effects in mixing and stirring also. Okay. Now, when we say that uh, the, uh, the pressure density and temperature uh, must be the same, so when we say that uh, pressure density and temperature must be the same everywhere, what we actually mean by that is that the uh, continuum must prevail. Okay. So, what do we mean by uh, continuum? Okay, before we define continuum, let us just complete this, uh, 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 this thought. So, when continuum prevails, properties such as pressure, density and temperature of the system under consideration are known without any ambiguity anywhere. Otherwise, when I measure temperature or pressure at one location, I get some value. I measure it at another location, I get some other value. Then we do not have an unambiguous value for that particular property of the system. Okay. So, what is required is that we must know the property values without any ambiguity. Okay. So, when we say that the pressure of air in a vessel is let us say 200 kilo Pascal, that means that it is 200 kilo Pascal everywhere and continuum prevails. Okay. So, what do we mean by uh, uh, continuum? 
ok. Uh, let us do a thought experiment. So, we uh, assume that we have a cubical vessel of uh, dimension L and let us say that it contains a certain amount of gas ok. Now, we have uh, on one of the walls of the vessel, let us say we have a, a viewport uh, made out of glass which allows us to uh, make observations of the contents within a fixed observation volume ok. So, the observation volume is known, we can make observations uh, of the contents of the observation volume within that volume ok. Now, let us say that uh, we now propose to measure the density of the gas uh, using the following methodology. We basically count the number of the uh, molecules at any instant in time, we count the number of molecules within, the, within this observation volume, we know the mass of the molecule and uh, so we know the observation volume. So, we can then calculate the density as um, uh, the mass of the total mass of the molecules divided by the observation volume. Okay. So, that is how we propose to uh, evaluate the density of the gas at an instant. So, at an instant we look at the observation volume, count the number of molecules, count the molecule mass or mass of all the molecules together divided by the observation volume. Okay. Now, if let us say that we have 100 molecules in the, in the vessel. Okay. So, if we start with 100 molecules inside the vessel, then the uh, measured density values uh, will actually fluctuate quite a bit, sometimes even going down to 0. We may not have any molecule at all inside our observation volume at some instance when we look and at some other instance we may have 5 molecules, 6, 10 and so on and so forth. So, the density value that we calculate will vary wildly from starting from 0 to some value which keeps changing with time. So, we do not know uh, the uh, value of density uh, unambiguously ok. Now, let us let us say that if you have another observation port and we measure the density there, the value that we get there at an instant will be different from the value that we measure at another observation port. So, uh, the values are not only varying with time at a given observation volume, they also vary across observation volumes if you have only 100 molecules. Let us say that we now increase the number of molecules progressively to say 10,000, uh, 100,000 and so on. Uh, so, we increase it to 1000, 10,000 and 100,000. Then we will notice that as we increase the number of molecules, the uh, fluctuations that we are seeing in the density values begin to diminish. Uh, they, they do not seem to even go down to 0. We always seem to have a finite number of molecules in our observation volume and the fluctuation within the uh, values themselves uh, do not seem to be very high. Okay. In fact, beyond a point we notice that the fluctuations die out completely. It does not seem to matter whether we increase the number of molecules beyond a threshold or how much we increase the number of molecules beyond a threshold. We get a single value for the density not only at a given observation volume, but at any observation volume in the vessel. Okay. That uh, is intuitively clear to us. Okay. Now, um, let us do the same experiment, but in, uh, this time measuring the pressure instead of the density. So, let us say that we have kept sensors at different locations on the, uh, on the walls of the vessel and as you know from your high school physics, pressure is nothing but force exerted by the molecules on the wall per unit area. Okay. So, we have pr uh, pressure sensors uh, which measure the force that is exerted and then we convert that depending on the area of the sensor, we convert that into a pressure. Okay. So, again when we uh, do this experiment, we notice that just like density, the values that we measure for pressure also show similar trends or similar fluctuations which uh, die out as the number of molecules is increased. And once we increase the number of molecules beyond a certain threshold, the, uh, the values remain constant and the fluctuations die out completely. Okay. So, we can surmise uh, based on uh, these two thought experiments that when the number of molecules is less, the molecules travel freely for a considerable distance of time. The number of molecules inside the vessel is less, so the molecules can travel freely uh, from one place to another without encountering another molecule or encountering the wall. Okay. But as we increase the number of molecules, the distance that the molecules can travel uh, freely uh, diminishes. Okay. So, the distance that they can travel before encountering another molecule or the wall diminishes 
and this distance is usually termed as the uh, mean free path. The distance uh, between collisions is uh, on an average is termed as the mean free path uh, and as the uh, mean free path decreases intuitively we know that the collision frequency also increases because the number of collisions increases. So, the mean free path also uh, decreases. Once the mean free path decreases below a certain uh, limiting value then the measured property values do not change anymore. Okay. So, once the, uh, uh, once the mean free path falls below a limiting value which is what happens when we increase the number of molecules uh, beyond a certain value as we said earlier when we increase it beyond a certain value we saw that the fluctuations uh, died down altogether. What uh, we can say now is that uh, as we increase the number of molecules the mean free path decreases and once the mean free path decreases below a certain value uh, the property values do not exhibit any fluctuations and they, uh, they have a constant value not only at one location but at any location uh, in the vessel. Okay. So, the gas is then said to behave as a continuum okay. that is a very important concept that we just talked about. So, for the macroscopic approach to hold continuum must prevail. So, what do we mean by continuum must prevail? This is what we mean that the mean free path should be very very small. Now, how do we quantify very very small? Very very small can mean many things in different contexts. So, how small is small is defined relative to the physical dimensions of the vessel. If the vessel itself is very very small then um, you know mean free path uh, being small actually is not quite meaningful. So, what we need to do is relate the mean free path to the physical dimensions of the vessel and that is what we do next. So, we define a parameter known as the Knudsen number which is defined as the ratio of the mean free path lambda to the characteristic dimension L. Okay. You may recall that we started this uh, thought experiment uh, by saying that the vessel is cubical with dimension L. So, we take that to be the characteristic dimension. Okay. Typically, uh, Knudsen number uh, when the Knudsen number is very, very small continuum is said to prevail. Okay. Again, um, general uh, guideline is that once the Newton number falls below 10 raise to minus 2, like it is 10 raise to minus 3 or even smaller, then we can safely say that continuum prevails. Once it increases to 10 raise to minus 2 or above, then we cannot uh, safely assume that continuum prevails and uh, uh, the effect of rarefaction meaning less number of molecules in the gas will become more pronounced as the uh, Newton number becomes higher and higher. But general guideline is that it should be uh, below 10 raise to minus 2 and smaller the better for uh, continuum to prevail. So, this is what we assume when we do macroscopic thermodynamics that the property values at any instant uh, are known uh, without any ambiguity and the property values are the same everywhere in the system regardless of where we measure the property value in the system. Okay. So, this brings us to a close of the first module.